I will hand it over to uh, our chair, um, Erica Tiburcio Moreno. Um, this panel, panel 14, is Gendered Subjectivity and the Politics of Filmmaking. Um, welcome, Erica, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Wickham, and thank you all for being here in this amazing panel, the panel 14th. Um, uh, our first speaker is Amy Jane Bosper, who recently completed her PhD in the Cultural Studies Department at Trent University. Her thesis was entitled Women in Horror on the, on the Screen, in the Scene, Behind the Screams, and combines psychoanalytic, uh, psychoanalytic film theory with original empirical research to examine the influence of women's increased involvement in the horror genre. After completing a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and Bachelor of Arts in Cultural Studies, Bosper attended Carleton University to obtain her Master of Art in Film Studies before beginning her doctoral research at Trent University. Her research interests include gender horror, fandom and fan culture, film noir, psychoanalysis, feminist film theory, new wave film movements, political economy, and the early Hollywood film industry. Her paper is entitled When the Woman Lurks, Gender in Modern Slasher Films. So thank you, Amy, when you want to start. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to just begin by uh, thanking Daniel and Wickham for all their hard work organizing this conference. Uh, when I first heard about uh, Slasher Studies Summer Camp, I felt an immediate sense of excitement and anticipation. The concept of a whole conference dedicated to a topic so near and dear to my heart was absolutely thrilling. Uh, it's been a distinct pleasure hearing different scholars discuss, dissect, and wax poetic about slasher films. If only all summer camps could be like this one. Uh, so I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint presentation here. So give me half a moment. Okay. So um, as uh, we already uh, had mentioned, I recently uh, completed and successfully defended my dissertation entitled Women in Horror on the Screen in the Scene Behind the Screams. For my doctoral thesis, I combined psychoanalytic film theory with original empirical research to investigate the evolving role of women in the horror genre. Among my myriad of research inquiries, I wanted to assess the differences between contemporary female-made horror and traditional, typically man-made slasher films. Given the changing landscape of horror and the recent increase in attention paid to women's contributions to the genre, I was specifically interested in speaking to women who have been directly responsible for and involved in the creation of horror. I consider myself incredibly fortunate to have had the opportunity to interview four Canadian horror creators, all of whom are women. I have images of them up here on the screen now. Uh, they offered unique insight into the productive processes behind the creation of horror, as well into, as into the motivational factors underscoring women's involvement in a genre so often accused of being predicated upon their victimization, exclusion, and devaluation. These women illuminated how horror film consumption and creation can be empowering and cathartic experiences for women, and it is my pleasure to share my findings with you. However, before delving into the data that I collected from these interviews, I would first like to set the metaphorical stage. My interest in researching women's contributions to the genre was born out of a desire to analyze women's unique relationship to horror. I wanted to address several key inquiries. Firstly, why women love horror films and what drives women to become fans and producers? Secondly, what are the commonalities across female-made horror films? And finally, what impact uh, do these films have on the horror genre itself? To perform this investigation, I employed several differing method methodological approaches. I reviewed the foundational literature of horror theory and constructed a historical account of female representation in three-dimensional capacities, female representation on screen, 
female representation in horror fan culture and female representation in the film industry. I surveyed a sample of self-identified female horror fans to collect data about their demographics, early experiences with the genre, consumption practices, thematic preferences, and personal opinions on the genre. And finally, I conducted interviews with women successfully navigating the industrial production of horror. It is through an assessment of the data amassed across these approaches that I will offer speculation on why women make horror, what sets women's horror apart and how these films have forever changed the slasher subgenre. The first question that I would like to address is why women gravitate towards horror and in turn what motivates them to become fans and producers of horror content. Reviewing the wealth of literature on the subject, I discovered a plethora of contrasting speculations on what drives women's consumption and enjoyment of a genre so historically notorious for its mistreatment of their gender. Some theorists argued that women enjoy horror as a form of cathartic escapism. Others theorized this enjoyment to be directly related to masochistic pleasure. However, despite Despite seemingly desperate rationalizations, the underlying and simplistic explanation was that of pleasure. In fact, most theorists seem to agree in one way or another that women who consume horror do so because they simply find it pleasurable. While this type of speculative analysis is of course a respectable and time-honored means of addressing inquiries, I was much more invested in the task of posing these questions to female fans and creators directly. For many of my study participants, they described their engagement with horror to be akin to a personal relationship. In fact, some directly compared their relationship to horror to that of a love affair or a best friendship. The women recalled feelings of isolation and alienation in childhood and reminisced about embracing horror fandom as a means of countering feelings of loneliness. They all indicated an inclination towards seeking out the most unusual or graphic of horror content, as well as an appreciation for independent and low budget fare, characteristic features of the slasher subgenre. In adulthood, these women are involved in horror fan culture as a form of community, a group of like-minded individuals with shared interests banded together. There was a sense of relief and reassurance in the experience of being part of something, of being a member of an inside group rather than a lonely outsider on the fringe. The innately othering experience of being a fan, of the obsessive nature of fanaticism, often leads fans to feel like outsiders in society, thus an establishing entrance into a fan culture is all the more attractive and comforting. Society often regards horror fandom as one of the most reproachable and dysfunctional forms of fandom, as evidenced by media frenzies and moral panics over the graphic violence emblematic of the genre. As a result, horror fans are demonized as the most deviant of the already deviant, the worst of the worst. It is no surprise that fans take refuge in alternative social communities, as Henry Jenkins calls them, spaces real and metaphorical in which they are no longer othered for their eccentric obsessions, but instead celebrated and praised for their generic knowledge and passionate enthusiasm. So now that we've established why women may be drawn to horror films and the corresponding fan culture, we can address the underlying motivational factors that foster their active participation in the creation of horror content. Despite some theories of spectatorship suggesting that viewers, especially women, consume film passively, the very existence of fan culture would seem to contradict these ideas. For many fans, whether it's analyzing on-screen content, writing fan fiction, performing cosplays, engaging in online discussion groups, or maintaining a fan collection, fandom is predicated upon active participation. In some cases, these fans are drawn to making their own contributions by way of film production. In the case of the women that I interviewed, their active engagement in fandom and fan culture directly led to their involvement in the creation of their own horror films. However, it's not merely a love of the genre that inspired these women. In many cases, their contributions were intended as a direct response to women's exclusion, victimization, and devaluation in horror, both on and off the screen. Jen and Sylvia Soska, who are in this image here, uh, set out to become Hollywood actresses. However, they were discouraged by the roles being offered to women. They were only ever asked to play highly sexualized female characters with no agency, objects placed on screen for male visual pleasure. Rather than comply with the industry's undesirable terms, they started creating their own films. Their films would be full of rich, nuanced female characters. They sought to create contemporary feminist slasher films with elaborate and compelling narratives. They would combine images of graphic violence with beautiful aesthetic and haunting musical scores. They actively fought to reconstitute the horror genre to suit themselves and their counterparts. 
I have an image here from their film American Mary, and as you can see, it is just beautifully uh, created. Similarly, Yvonka Kukovac addressed, or sorry, similarly, Yvonka Kukovac witnessed horrendous displays of sexism and misogyny while working in the horror film industry. So she began development, with the help of many other women on her team, of reconstituting the horror film set as a space of feminist empowerment and inclusivity. Not only did this serve to transform a previously male-dominated space, but opened up many new career opportunities for women having women having difficulty finding work in the industry. These women are active engage in the process of making space for themselves and for other women. Let us now turn to discuss the commonalities across female-made horror and slasher films. Firstly, it is crucial to acknowledge the fact that female horror directors exist in limited numbers, though these ranks are growing. Many theorists have grappled with understanding why women may not be drawn to working in horror. According to Elisa Cosma, female horror directors must contend with a double marginalization in that their identity as both female directors and female contributors to the horror genre doubly assert their status as outsiders, which is not dissimilar to how horror fans themselves have been regarded. There have been reiterated misconceptions about a purportedly universal dislike of horror shared by all women. However, women's active involvement in horror fandom and horror production easily falsify these claims. Some theories suggest that women only enjoy feminine forms of horror, which is described by Bridget Cherry as psychological and supernatural horror. This is theorized to be motivated by women identifying images of graphic violence to be a barrier to pleasure. In my study, however, the participants reported an enjoyment of slasher and serial killer horror films, two subgenres of horror characterized by their inclusion of graphic violence. In fact, when, direct, when directly asked about their opinion on graphic violence, the majority of my participants indicated that they were very comfortable with violence, with nearly 30% reporting they actively enjoy it. Therefore, it's evident that a distaste for violence does not deter women from working in horror. Rather, it would seem that the industry itself does not always foster an encourage women's involvement behind the scenes. However, in recent years, we are witnessing an influx of female directors infiltrating the horror genre. According to Katarina Paskowitz, the novelty of this form of authorship opens up space for rethinking women's film practice and creativity in genres historically deemed suitable only to the masculine imagination. Woman-helmed horror can then function as both a critique of a genre with an undeniably misogynistic history, as well as a reclamation of a space rife for political and feminist commentary. Female authorship transforms transforms horror into a subversive exploration of the lived female experience, which according to Amelia Moses, is achieved through the reclaiming of problematic narratives and tropes. As a result, female-helmed horror films often center on themes that speak to the horrors of the female experience. As described by Dan Vena and Erin Harrington, women's horror films focus on topics such as sexuality, menstruation, virginity, gender-based violence, trauma, PT, PTSD, eating disorders, pregnancy, and motherhood, but all from a woman's perspective and specifically intended to speak to female audiences. Vena also suggests that women's horror often showcases a woman at the center of a narrative undergoing a transformation, such as from girl to woman, from woman to monster, from victim to avenger, as symbolically representative of women's real life struggles for subjectivity within the oppressive confines of patriarchal structures. Vena describes how women's horror affirms women's experiences of fear, paranoia, anxiety, and desire, and addresses the ways in which living in patriarchy constitutes its own horror. This is made especially evident through an analysis of the collaborative anthology film XX from 2017. In her interview, Yukovac described how all of the female filmmakers were given complete creative freedom with their segments of the film, and they not, did not discuss their individual work with one another during production. When it came time to assemble the film, they were astounded to find that many of the narratives addressed common themes such as family, children, the home, food and eating disorders, and women's bodies in general. Even without communicating with other filmmakers, the women were drawn to focusing on these topics and themes that have come to typify women's horror. In addition to thematic commonalities, women's horror films tend to incorporate the self-reflexivity of contemporary slasher films, but through a feminist lens. Sonia Lufer suggests that female horror filmmakers demonstrate a predilection towards active experimentation with the genre, as they perceive the horror genre as a particularly viable means for the exploration of women's issues, while simultaneously legitimizing women's fears in a creative and cathartic ma manner. 
Lufer identifies intertextual references as a typifying component of films created by female horror fans turned producers. The women incorporate direct and subversive intertextual references to actively recall and restructure the stylistic and narrative content of their favorite horror films, with the objective of highlighting that which they deem to be the most crucial and compelling to their fellow female horror fans. When Jen and Sylvia Soska set out to make their slasher film, See No Evil 2, they conceptualized it as an homage or a love letter to the slasher genre, especially to their favorite slasher film, Halloween 2. In fact, Jen Soska described it as an irresistible compulsion to include intertextual references to other horror films and even to their favorite directors. In this way, female horror fans salvage that which they deem most beneficial and serviceable from the history of horror to be amalgamated and mobilized into their own unique contributions to the industry, which further facilitate intertextual discourses between current fans and future producers. Okay, so up to this point, I have discussed my findings regarding women's active participation in fandom and uh, horror film production. I would like to finish with a brief discussion of the impact of women's contributions on the horror genre, specifically to the developmental evolution of the modern slasher film. Since the inception of the subgenre, the the slasher film has relied upon recycled and regurgitated generic conventions. Many scholars have addressed female representation in slasher films, typically identifying women as visually spectacular victims of masculine coded monsters, ill-fated feminine monsters, or androgynous final girls who fight their way to the finale with brute masculine force. However, in recent years, we've witnessed an emergence of a new type of female representation in slasher films. I argue that a change in authorship, that is more women at the helm of horror film production, has fostered the development of a new representation, which I have named the feminist monster. The feminist monster is an amalgamation of prior on-screen representations of women horror. She is simultaneously victim, monster, and survivor. However, however, rather than being defined by her victimhood or monstrosity, she's empowered by her difference and often functions as a lawless vigilante seeking, seeking vengeance on those who have wronged her or her gender. However, to best theorize and comprehend the inception of this new representation, it is imperative to examine her roots, which are founded in three pre-existing representations of women in horror. The first, and arguably most prevalent, is that of the woman as victim. The female victim in horror is intended to provide visual pleasure for the male spectator through her sexual and corporeal objectification, as well as function to alleviate his anxieties regarding sexual difference. The second representation is that of the woman as monster. The female monster, or Creed's monstrous feminine, also affords the male spectator pleasure, as her inevitable destruction allays his anxieties about castration and feminine power. And I have some images here of some mon monstrous women throughout horror history. The third representation is that of woman as survivor. The representation of the lone survivor, or Clover's final girl, additionally provides the male spectator with pleasure through his indulgence in narcissistic scopophilia by a means of a specialized form of cross-gender identification designed to reaffirm the spectator's masculinity and superiority. An examination of the literature exploring these representations revealed that women in horror, even when represented as monstrous females or resilient survivors, are always victimized. Additionally, the aforementioned literature privileges the male gaze through gendered assumptions regarding authorship and address. This illuminates that despite women's contributions to the genre, there was once a notable historical absence of theoretical literature focusing on horror films with a distinctively fem female authorship or address, an absence, an absence which Paskowitz refers to as an invisible history. I contend that the recent inception of feminist slasher films are intended to challenge generic conventions by placing a feminist monster at the center of the horror film narratives as the film's protagonist, as opposed to casting the female monster as a central antagonist. The narrative then unfolds from the monster's perspective, just as the slasher film forces identification with a monstrous character by align aligning the spectator with the killer's point of view. Through the though the feminist monster is an amalgamation of all prior representations of women in horror, she also has much in common with the slasher film antagonist or killer. Her monstrosity is created or born out of a traumatic event. Her methods of killing are graphic and characterized by creativity and self-reflexivity. She is the central focal point of the narrative, and audience members find themselves cheering for her rather than sympathizing for the victims, as is often the case with sla slasher franchise antiheroes such as Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger. 
Her victims are depicted as somehow deserving of punishment, akin to how the slasher film has been interpreted as upholding social mores by punishing those who engage in immoral behavior, such as premarital sex, underage drinking, and illegal drug use. However, the feminist monster punishes those who contrive to oppress or victimize women and other marginalized folks. As such, the feminist slasher film could be interpreted as an updated and feminist reimagining of slasher films as modern morality tales. Interestingly, the feminist monster's attack is rarely unprovoked. In fact, she typically functions as a lawless vigilante seeking vengeance on men for their misdeeds. In American Mary, titular Mary seeks revenge after being raped. In Anna Lily Amir Poor's A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, the vampire protagonist, known only as the girl, attacks pimps and drug dealers who are lured and baited by the vulnerable sight of a woman walking home alone at night. In Ginger Snaps, the teenage werewolf uses her newfound monstrosity to punish those responsible for her and her sister's social exclusion and torment. In Karen Kusama's Jennifer's Body, Jennifer seeks revenge on men who erroneously mistook her for a virgin and offered her as a sacrifice to Satan. Furthermore, Janice Lorek interprets the corporeal transformations in Ginger Snaps and Jennifer's Body to be metaphorical representations of, and thus violent resistances to, how patriarchal culture constructs women's sexuality as monstrous. In Anna Biller's The Love Witch, Elaine punishes men for sexually objectifying women. In Teeth, Dawn uses her vagina dentata to castrate rapists. In Sophia Takao's modernized feminist reimagining of Black Christmas, the sorority girls exact revenge on rapists and murderers in a secret fraternity dedicated to the subjugation of women. While the feminist monster is not always an embodiment of what Cherry describes as a feminist revenge fantasy, such as in The Babadook, where Amelia's monstrosity is a manifestation of repressed grief, it can be inferred that feminist monstrosity is always a resistance against patriarchal society's victimization of women. Therefore, the development of this new representation of femininity can be interpreted as an active and defensive protest against the future victimization of women in horror. In conclusion, I argue that a change in authorship and address has led to the development of a new form of the slasher film. These feminist horror films place monstrous women at the center of the narrative. However, unlike previous manifestations of monstrous women, the feminist monster is not victimized by her monstrosity. Instead, she is empowered and strengthened by it, more closely aligning her to the traditional male-coded slasher film killer. The feminine monster serves as, some, as a symbolic representation of women fighting for agency, empowerment, and inclusion in, the hor in horror, as a genre, as a fan culture, and as a productive process. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Amy. It was really interesting. So let's go to the second speaker, Bruna Foleto Lucas, who's a filmmaker that turned academic, and she's currently on the second year of her PhD at Kingston University, London, where she's expanding her previous work that is called Women's Collective Nightmare, a look at horror films directed by women developed between 2016 and 2017, and uh, where she's analyzing the, the role of the women in horror films. Bruna has been writing as a film critic and a, a film reviewer for websites such as London Horror Society and UK Film Reviewer. Her paper is called We Will Never Bow Down, How Black Christmas Subverts the Trope of the slasher subgenre and offers a possibility for feminist filmmaker. So thank you, Bruna. And thank you, Erica. Uh, so I'm just gonna uh, echo everyone who's who's been a part of this um, of this conference. I just really want to thank Daniel and Wickham for putting that together. I'm really, really honored to be a part of this conference. Having said that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And as per usual, if you cannot see it, please shout. So then I know that I'm not just not presenting it. I hope everyone can see it. I'm just gonna assume everyone can. And if not, someone will tell me. So like Erica said, the title of my paper is We Will Never Bow Down, How Black Christmas Subverts the Tropes of the Slasher Subgenre and Offers a Possibility for Feminist Filmmaking. So co-written by April Wolf and Sophia Taco and directed by Taco, the 2019 Black Christmas sets up a feminine universe where the majority of the characters are female 
and the male characters, albeit not all, are portrayed as evil. The film revolves around the sorority sisters as they keep receiving threatening messages from a Hawthorne account, the fictional university they're in. Little by little, the sisters start disappearing and it is, it is up to Riley, Chris and Marty to find out what's been happening and to fight the killers. The killers in turn form a small army of young men who are possessed by the spirit of Colvin Hawthorne, uh, the founder of the university they're in, and who as explained by Professor Gelson, foresaw the threat posed by women and took precautions in case they strayed too far out of line. Professor, Professor Gelson is extremely misogynistic and he's the one who takes Coven Hawthorne's, uh, Coven Hawthorne's prediction literally and forms a young, an army of young men to take our power back. As a remake of the 1974 proto-slasher Black Christmas, Sophia Takao's film falls into the slasher subgenre, which has been questionable in its relationship with female characters. It is a well-known stereotype that the most telling indicator of a bad and disposable girl in this leisure film is sexual activity. Treading a tightrope not to be over-reductive, a formula of leisure has been drawn. A male killer who's often psychosexually disturbed due to his incestuous or masochistic relationship with his overbearing or sadistic mother punishes women for their seemingly free lifestyle. Indeed, Robin Wood describes the first cycle of leisure films as violence against women or teeny kill pig. Tony, Tony, Tony Magistral investigates this issue and sees it as a backlash from the second wave of feminism in which the killer seeks to establish masculine dominance over a world that has been um, turned upside down by women. Uh, Robin Wood described these killers as avenging super egos who thrust traditional values upon rebellious teenagers to make sure they fit into the mold. As a slasher, Black Christmas checked many of the box, boxes of the subgenre, and the film parallels the films from the 80s. Takao's film, however, offers a twist. The narrative of the film does not pu push forward the reactionary message of selective survival as the transgressive girls survive. Moreover, the motive for the killers is not sexual or gender confusion. It is fear of the non phallic power, as theorized by Susan Lurie, who revisits Freud's and Lacan's theories of sexual difference uh, and the power of the phallus to develop a feminist reading of the castrated woman. She argues that the sight of woman as a castrated is a comforting and mature male wish fulfillment fantasy designed to counter the real terror the sight of woman inspires, that she's not castrated despite the fact that she has no penis and does inspire male fear for his castration precisely for having an incredible amount of non phallic power. In Kristeva's terms, the castrated woman is the objected woman. I should suggest that by expelling the objection, women are rejecting themselves. I expel myself, I spit myself out, and I object myself. In Black Christmas 2019, Lurie's theory of the non phallic power is clearly portrayed. The film is set in a university and the characters are in their last year, therefore almost entering workforce, adulthood, or Lacan's symbolic. As the female characters are being active, either in school or social life, they're creating petitions, asking questions, speaking out about abuse, they're threatening male stability. As Professor Gelson puts it towards the end of the film, we're simply men, tired of seeing ourselves falsely accused or livelihoods threatened marginalized and belittled, reduced to spectators in our own lives. Upon graduation, our army will venture into courtrooms, boardrooms, and the halls of Congress to set the world right. The example that Gelson uses, courtrooms, boardrooms, and halls of Congress, alludes to the fact that the symbolic is masculine. The women who disobey must be killed, must be objected, or they must object themselves. Thus, this army of young men uh, the killers in Black Christmas are indeed avenging super egos that want to castrate women because they fear their non phallic power and the possibility of them threatening the symbolic. Therefore, they want to reinstate traditional values and create mindless women who will take their place behind the men. The main focus of Black Christmas is the construction of the female characters. Contrasting with the final girls from earlier slashers, especially those explored by Clover, who are predominantly, if not all, Caucasian, 
the characters here are intersectional. Riley, Chris, Riley, Chris, Jesse, Marcy, and Helena are all different. They all have their set of anxieties and backgrounds. backgrounds. Chris, for example, is the crusader. She's the most outspoken when it comes to everyday sexism and racism. Riley, as I'll uh, explain a little bit, is the eyes of the film. Marty is explored through her relationship with her boyfriend, which presents them both as equal instead of falling for the my boyfriend only one sex trope. And Helena is a very interesting character because she betrays her sisters to help the killers. Helena then is the example of the woman who has objected herself in order to find her place in the symbolic. But the symbolic is not kind to her and treats her as a throwaway character. Her death serves to, serves, serves to illustrate what will happen to lose women. The film portrays Helena as having less power than her sisters. She tells Riley how bad she's at singing, she cannot hold her alcohol, she's constantly shown as impotent. As Riley wanders through the frat house, she witnesses a possible abuse and helps Helena. Here, Helena is framed within the opening of the door. She's restrained by her, um, by her abuser and by the camera. This limitation and powerlessness is seen in the following scenes where Helena is at home, yeah, sorry, is at home and filmed mostly in full shots, the privileged environment over her. She's restricted by walls and door frames and she does not hold the power to move the camera as its stillness makes Helena move within the frame rather than explore the environment she's in. Moreover, her point of view leads to empty corridors and empty rooms, so much so that she does not see the men hiding in her room. In the climax of Black Christmas, two sorority fights against the stacked of men led by Gaussen and by destroying Hawthorne's bust, they free the men who are under the spell thus making the important distinction of present, presenting patriarchy rather than men as the evil other. The ending of the film makes women victorious. And although Wood argues that the happy ending in a horror film typically indicates the restoration of normalcy and repression, the happy ending in Black Christmas serves a different purpose. By killing the villains, the film is not restoring normalcy. Rather, it is eradicating it and creating another. Thus, by shining a light on the dangers of patriarchy and painting it as the evil, as the evil rather than normalcy strives for, Takao subverting the subgenre even further. Isabel Cristina Pinedo argues that the open ending postmodern horror films allow for the danger to come back, portraying the threat as ever present in our society. In the original Black Christmas, for example, Jess, the final girl, survives the end of the film where she's left alone and unconscious in, in her room while the killer is out there. She has no possibility of fighting back if the killer chose to, chose to strike back. Um, he would probably win and she would probably die. However, the survivors in Takao's Black Christmas have closed the door on the threat, but they literally stand in line if he chose to come back. Now let us turn to the look, which, as Wood explains, is an extension of, extension of the phallic power. Indeed, Linda Williams argues that the modern horror film associates the act of looking with the expression of desire, which is granted to the female characters before ultimately punishing her for it. She also argues that the look belongs to men as she focuses on the looks in the audience. While the man looks and enjoys the film, when the woman looks, she's punished, she's punished with the sight of her own victimization. Movie theorizes on the male gaze and it claims that the ability to look belongs to the male characters and the male audience member, leaving the female characters with the burden of being looked at. The motive of looking for and looking at is present throughout the three films. The 1974 film, uh, revolves around the police and the sorority sisters trying to discover who's also, who is orchestrating the pornographic phone calls to the house, and the subplot revolves around the disappearance and search of two female characters. In the 2006 film, the sisters are constantly looking at pictures and videos, and the dialogue emphasizes voyeurism. As one of the sisters says, Father Christmas is just a fat voyeur. And finally, in 2019, in the 2019 film, Riley actively looks for the two female characters who have disappeared, 
and all of the sisters look for their lost objects. So the eyes, more importantly the look, are foregrounded in the Black Christmas films. In both the original and the first remake, the point of view of the killer is present throughout the film. In fact, Black Christmas was one of the earliest North American films to use extensively the killer POV. The film starts with a point of view sequence as the looker enters the sorority house. But instead of inciting terror in the characters, the killer decides uh, to hide in the, in the house using the killer POV throughout the film to augment the sense of terror. With the scene and the many others, the film clearly presents the killer as the one with power. He's the bearer of look, and as we've seen before, to look is to have power. The killer maintains his power throughout the film, and much like Williams argues, the female characters who try to look are punished. So in the first film, we have Claire, who I don't have the picture here, but she's the first victim. She's watched through a point of view shot and right after she tries to retain the look by investigating noises, she's killed. Then we have Mrs. Mack, the second victim who dies while looking for the house cat. And then we go to Barb's death scene, which is really interesting as she's the first one to actually hold the gaze for a short moment. And through her eyes, we see the first shot of the killer. So Barb is asleep and she wakes up to find the killer on top of her, ready to penetrate her with a glass unicorn. Her point of view shows us the killer ready to strike and his left eye is only a part of him that is receiving any light, while the other one is in shadows. Thus his view is only partial as Barb has just stolen, has just stolen his gaze. Because of, a, because of that, his attack on Barb is the most violent. However, uh, when we go to Jess, the final girl, we have a similar um, similar moment. So, for example, upon receiving a call from the police saying that the killer is inside the house, Jess goes up the stairs to find her friends, and in doing so, she encounters the killer. Here we're shown Jess's point of view, and just like what happened to Barb, we see the killer's eye, while the other one is hidden. Jess holds the gaze and the killer's violent reaction is of someone who has been robbed of something. While hiding, Jess's, eye be Jess's eyes becomes fra become framed by the light and it becomes clear that she now possesses the much sought and powerful gaze. She uses it to her advantage as she fights and kills Peter, her boyfriend, her boyfriend whom she thought was the killer. Jess wins the battle, however, she does not win the war as the film makes it clear that the killer was not actually Peter and he's actually still alive in the house. In the 2006 Black Christmas, the eyes play a much more important position in the film. Much like the original, the gaze is held by the killer throughout the film and those who try to gain die. This is supported by the fact that the killers, Billy and Agnes, remove their victims' eyes, punishing them even further for attempting to look. The pattern of death is as follows. The victims go look for something, they are killed, and their eyes are removed and used as Christmas tree ornaments, highlighting their inefficacy and ultimate role as just decorative. From the outset, the girls are shown as powerless objects. They're watched through windows and filmed in sex tapes. Further, they're usually shot from behind and the film abuses of uh, camera angles. There are no rules here. The characters are filmed from high and low angles, from wide shots to extreme close-ups. There is a shower scene in which the character Lauren is gazed upon during an intimate moment. She is drunk, unaware, and naked. The objective camera proves to be a subjective camera as the low angle is actually Billy's erotic gaze. In point of fact, all of the angles are point of view shots. Billy has full access to the house and he has made holes in various places which allow him to look for, for uh, to look at the women from any angle. Uh, while the young women's looks are constantly highlighted as ineffective, Billy's eyes are constantly in evidence. Not only are the flashbacks flashbacks told through his point of view, the motives of eye everywhere is present in the house. When his eyes are not physically present, poster on the wise depict open ones. Nonetheless, much like the previous film, the ending presents a jewel to hold the gaze. As Kelly fights and kills Billy, she's able to retain the look, 
and not just momentarily, as Jess, but she's able to claim the look as her own. Indeed, the last shot of the film, which I don't know if you can see it, it's uh, here. The last shot of the film um, shows her point of view, which, um, which shows Billy's dead body. And then we go to the look in Black Christmas 2019, which still foregrounds the look, but the dynamics a little bit different. While the previous films, uh, the killers re re retain the ability to look um, and the female characters were uh, punished or killed for attempting to seize it, here the female characters, most precisely Riley, hold the gaze throughout the film. When we are introduced to Riley, she's looking at herself in the mirror She's controlling, she's controlling what the audience sees and how they see it. She's the one who's looking for her missing friends and the camera moves according to her movements. Thus, she's literally moving the film forward. However, her power is momentarily interrupted when she enters the university as the camera stops and moves again with Professor Gaussen. Within the academic sphere, most precisely the, precisely the classroom, Professor Gaussen is powerful. He's shown in front of a number of students who are powerless and at his mercy. The camera follows him as he moves back and forth, delivering a speech focusing on protecting his own rights to teach anything he wants. Once outside the university, the camera is back at Riley's side. There are a couple of instances where Riley, Chris, and Marty are the object of the killer POV as the camera peeks from from inside of the university, alluding to the real villain of the film. During this point of view shot, the female characters are shown as small and their power is diminished. During the party at a frat house, Riley peeks through an open door and sees a secret hazing ritual. Here, Riley is subverting the trope that grants the killer the privilege of the secret POV by quietly watching the killers and gaining knowledge of their secret. Therefore, Riley's gaze is the prevalent look in the film instead of the killer's. In the same sequence, Riley inter uh, Riley's gaze interrupts Helena potential rape. Here, her look is not sexualizing or objectifying the characters, but denying the objectification altogether. In the film's climax, when one of the killers is about to attack Riley, Professor Gelson urges the other killers to see no evil boys, whereupon all of the young men use the hood of their capes to hide their eyes. Here the film is once more highlighting the fact that they do not possess the look, as it is the lack of vision that is their downfall, as they're unable to see the army of women coming their way. The film ends pretty much like the, uh, the previous one. The killers are dead and the survivors stand in line, almost like, almost like an army alert should the killers come back to life. Similar to Kelly's point of view at the end of 2006 film, here the film ends framing Riley's eyes as she looks at the burning frat house. Those are some of my references and thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bruna. So our next speaker is May Santiago, who's a film scholar and a micro budget filmmaker. Her work focuses on using cinema as a cultural study tool for undeveloped film economies in the Caribbean. She possesses a Bachelor, a bachelor of Fine Arts in Film Production from the University of Central Florida, where produced Little Girls in 2013 as her undergraduate thesis film as part of a study of teen films and the effect they have on female teen societies. She also possesses a Master's of Fine Arts in Digital Entrepreneurial Cinema from the University of Central Florida, where she created Night Gaze in 2017, a visual album based on music video theory to depict a young woman's visceral experience with depression. Her work has screened across the United States, including the, Bro the Brooklyn Women's Film Festival, Tampa Bay Comic Con, Florida's Undergraduate Research Conference, Orlando Film Festival, and more. May currently runs a foreign horror-based podcast, podcast, sorry, she hosts and writes Horror Spirit, 
she is per, she's pursuing a PhD at George, Main, George Mason University's Cultural Studies studies program with a focus on Puerto Rican cinema and nationalization of its archives. So uh, May, when you want to start, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Erica, and uh, thank you to uh, the organizers, Daniel and Wickham, for having me, as well as the really incredible people I'm sharing this panel with. Um, I know a lot of their work, and they are really awesome, so I am very intimidated, and let's get started. Um, all right, one second, please. All right, hopefully you can see this um, and uh, we will get started. All right, so my paper is Queer Slashers. Um, it's sort of like a history of queer slashers and what that even kind of means. Um, this is taken from a chapter that's coming out next year that I wrote, um, which is more at large about queer horror. And I made a special version of uh, this paper uh, specific to the slasher subject for this conference. Um, and specifically when looking at that history, you know, what uh, looking at the queer gazes, queer spectatorship, queer sensibility, and queer authorship that comes along um, with that analysis. If you want to reach out to me, please do so. That's my email and my social media tag down below for Twitter and Instagram. Um, all right, so shame surrounding queerness and outright homophobia has been a contributing factor in the representation of queer bodies in the horror genre since its inception in America, since most horror films referencing or using queer bodies are made by non-queer authors. As a result, dangerous appropriations and misinformed tropes of the queer body have run rampant in a genre expressive of national and generational cultural anxieties. Cinema remains one of the most effective ideological tools in society, and horror cinema remains immensely popular, particularly for young audiences learning through films. Thus, identifying the harm caused to marginalized communities through filmic representation or absence is paramount, particularly to the range of people who identify as queer in some form, but also for the non-queer spectator who can unlearn or avoid altogether uh, the harmful genre codes present in the representation of queer identities on screen in horror cinema. For many spectators, seeing a marginalized identity on screen establishes a reference. If that reference is problematically, even nefariously construed, the likelihood of violence off screen screen, physical, emotional, or verbal, increases to people who share a marginalized identity. Clearly, the shame about queerness that influences the filmmaking process has consequences, not just for the filmic work, but also for the ideological dispositions of the audience. In order for the horror genre to retain its boundary-pushing bravado, these borders of representation and authorship should be scrutinized. This scrutiny becomes all the more urgent when we note the consistent historical increase in both queer authorship and queer audiences within the horror genre. Um, so really it's just kind of looking at the historical context of like queer representation, authorship and spectatorship. And that once we begin to sort of see where the discrepancies come amidst these terms, it serves as an opening to see a possible future for uh, these concepts in the horror genre to kind of make better films, smarter films. Um, so the history of queer horror in U.S. cinema begins even before the queer body was shown on the silver screen in the early 1930s in films such as The Old Dark House from 1932 and Dracula's Daughter from 1936. Decades before queer horror existed, a 1915 Supreme Court decision, Mutual Film Corporation versus Ohio Industrial Commission, created the legal relationship between censorship boards and government agencies. Effectively, this decision asserted that the new medium of cinema would not be covered by the free speech clause of the First Amendment. This ruling set the groundwork for the 1929 creation of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America and the Production Code, which you can see an excerpt right here. Um, this is the censorship. This is the censorship code that would come to rule in Hollywood from 1934 until the until the early 1950s. The code, meant to halt the trend of scandalous and salacious cinematic content, was written by two Catholic officials, Martin Quigley and Father Daniel A. Lord. At the time, the two men met with studio heads 
heads and were promised adherence to the code, but uptake and enforcement was slow. Perversely, rather than make cinema more conservative, the code ended up enabling more transgressive cinema with the creation of new genres, including a subjective form of cinema influenced by Gothic novels and newly arrived German expressionist immigrants, the horror genre. The era between 1929 and 1934, when the production code was finally enforced through governmental law, is known as the pre-code era, widely considered to be the last hurrah before implications of homosexuality, miscegenation, extramarital affairs, unpunishable crime, and a milieu of other deviances were banned from the silver screen. Despite the official ban, many filmmakers continued to find ways to present taboo subjects in their work, often using genre codes to subvert the censors. Queer directors and writers in the genre can be dated to the pre-code era. Due to the prohibition of homosexuality within the production code, the presence of openly queer directors, writers, and actors was minimal and controversial at best. James Whale, Dorothy Arzner, and George Cocor remain the most well-known queer authors of this period, especially because their films did not shy away from queer characters, contexts, or codes. Yet, these closets were as restrictive for their authors as they were for their characters. Harry Benshoff argues that queerness and horror, particularly in the 20th century, has been treated as, quote, a monstrous condition, insofar as movie monsters and homosexuals' closets uphold and reinforce culturally constructed binaries of gender and sexuality that structure Western thought, end quote. Even in films like The Old Dark House, directed by James Whale, there is negative coding of disabled characters as queer monsters, a trope that has been reused for decades with the presence of, quote, supporting characters who contribute little to the narrative, but a lot to the ominous tone a horror film frequently demands, end quote. And so, um, you know, I, I think one thing I just really want to take from this before we begin to move forward into looking at the slasher subgenre is that these queer codes predate horror. They even predate the production code. Um, in the early 1910s and silent, uh, cin uh, in silent, cinema, there were cross-dressing westerns that were very popular both in the UK and America, which was the first time that we were seeing uh, the gender, uh, the transgression of the gender binary on screen and the implications that that led to sexual deviance. And you then begin to see these very early incarnations of these codes and the cinematic semiotics uh, creep up in early horror cinema like Hitchcock's Rebecca from 1940 with the stoicism and, and the uh, embedded in the lesbian coding of Mrs. Danvers and how that led to her her unrequited love and, and deep hatred of um, pretty much everyone in that film, right? Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, um, especially as we begin to see, you know, what becomes the slasher genre, where queer horror can go and what queer slashers can look like. So I do want to begin to... Uh, draw some definitions to kind of keep things straight. So in order to contextualize the significance of the critical history of queer horror, appropriation, and authorship, uh, we first need to appreciate the role of filmmaking and spectatorship in the formation of epistemic terrains and locations. As David Kuhn writes, quote, the story is told not by one person, but by a team of people, an actor, a director, a writer, a cinematographer, a costume designer, and many others work together to craft the details of the story and its presentation, not just to the diegetic therapist, but to viewers watching the film in a theater, on their television, or through some other means, end quote. There is a continuous process for the spectator as they recognize codes from the genre specific to the story socially specific. Films position spectators to see through the perspective of a character meshed with the spectator's intersectional gaze. The interpolation instigated by the film fuses with the personal history and positionality of the spectator in their culture and society. In her seminal essay on Black female spectatorship, Bell Hooks writes of the oppositional gaze she developed by both not having access to the racial gaze offered to black men or the specific power to look possessed by the white hegemony. She writes, quote, not only would I not be hurt by the absence of a black female presence or the insertion of violating representation, I interrogated the work, cultivated a way to look past race and gender for aspects of content, form, and language, end quote. Who can look is not made equal or even accessible to all spectators, be it because of gender, race, or sexuality, or sometimes a mixture of that. Marginalized spectators embrace a look that is very different from the heterosexual male gaze first theorized by Laura Mulvey. It is not enough to try to see within the heterosexist lens because seeing necessarily becomes something interrogative 
for the queer spe spectator, particularly non-homonormative spectators. The default heterosexist gaze antagonizes the non-normative queer spectator to the extent that violence is perpetuated on screen through the abuse, absence, or appropriation of queer bodies. Uh, Hooks continues, Quote, looking at films with an oppositional gaze, Black women were able to critically assess the cinema's construction of white womanhood as object of phallocentric gaze and choose not to identify with either the victim or the perpetrator. Black female spectators who refuse to identify with white womanhood, who would not take on this phallocentric gaze of desire and possession, created a critical space where the binary opposition multi-posits of woman as image, man as bearer of the look, was continually deconstructed, end quote. To bring the antagonism into focus is thus the work of a queer oppositional gaze. However, an explicitly queer gaze remains somewhat elusive and difficult to establish given the very expansive terrain of experience supposedly captured under the signifier of queer itself. Trevor Anderson once defined the queer gaze as, quote, how lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people create and view art. Moreover, it challenges binary notions of existence and storytelling employed in many male gaze versus female gaze conversations where the context is usually heterosexual. This definition does not seem to suffice, particularly in the horror genre. In horror, the malignant representation of queerness is so viscerally violent that it induces generational and cultural trauma that reaches across the closeted queer community in Hollywood, the horror genre, and the closets of spectators interpolated in the exploitation of their embodied response. Yet the collective experience of queer spectatorship, gazing, and authorship falls within a shared ground between the oppositional gaze, the queer gaze, and collaborative filmmaking. This is where the discrepancy between queer appropriation, queer authorship, and queer sensibility can be established to better understand where queer horror should go, as well as the positionality not of the queer spectator, but of queer spectators and their diverse plurality to queerness. Queer authorship arises when queer filmmakers, when quote, queer filmmakers have claimed the status of author and used it to critique heteronormative culture, either through the content of their films or by reimagining the cinematic language used to tell stories, end quote. Queer authorship has been growing within the horror movement, especially in the 21st century, and also lends itself to the notion of a queer sensibility, a mode of filmmaking by a queer author that may not have queerness explicit in its filmic text, but has a non-normative critique embedded within its depiction of heteronormative culture. Um, and before I move on to a couple of examples of what I mean by these terms, another thing I want to bring up is what is a slasher, right? We're looking at slashers in this conference. And so there have been so many great definitions of slashers given uh, over the course of this weekend. This is taken from thefinalgirl.com. And I just, again, want to keep this in mind, particularly when we think about how queer authorship and queer sensibility begin to warp the very form of the, of the slasher, right? Not every queer horror is a slasher. And so it's kind of important to keep this in mind as we move forward in this analysis. Um, so a really great place to start uh, is with a film that is often considered a slasher precursor, right? Which would be a uh, Hitchcock psycho um, with the coding of male baits, uh, the main villain. Uh, so Hitchcock's most demeaning and lasting appropriation of queer codes and the queer body is undeniably found in psycho. Not only is there no respect given to any possible history Bates might have with transgenderism or body dysmorphia, but the very fact that Bates does also cross dress is the nucleus of his abjection. Correlating Norman's gender dysmorphia through psychoanalysis, uh, Barbara Cree refers to Norman's desire, uh, Norman's, quote, desire to become the mother is motivated not by love, but by fear. He wants to become the mother in order to prevent his own castration, to castrate rather than to be castrated, end quote. This, uh, this, um, this code especially has been repeated throughout the horror genre and horror adjacent genres, um, pr proliferally, uh, throughout, um, since, since its debut, but it is especially uh, relevant in our case with Slashers, with uh, 1983's Sleepaway Camp, directed by Robert Hiltzvik. Um, so Sleepaway Camp, nearly 20 years later, would repeat this harmful coding in a heightened fetishistic manner with Angela, a teenage girl. Detrimental homosexual codes already foreground the start of the film when her father takes his children and his partner out near Camp Arawak for a trip. Angela's brother is killed after a prank gone wrong, and Angela becomes estranged from her father, haunted by visions of her father in bed with his partner. Eight years after the incident, Angela is sent out to Camp Arawak, where grisly murders begin cropping up upon her arrival. Angela is bullied, but is sheltered 
by the camp's counselors, Susie and Ronnie, at, as this behavior continues during her stay. One by one, Angela's tormentors die in mysterious and gruesome manners, ranging from death via wasp hive to rape via a hot curling iron. As the suspect list narrows and the camp turns into murderous havoc, Susie and Ronnie discover Angela on the beach by her lonesome. A shock is revealed through a slow tracking shot of a growling Angela spliced with cuts to a horrified Susie and Ronnie, stating what the camera exposes with exploitative flair. The naked anatomy of a teenage of a, of a teenage transgender girl soundtracked with dread. 31 years after the release of Sleepaway Camp, Robert Hiltzkick, uh, director and writer of the film, was asked about the inspiration behind the queer twist to the film, to which he said, quote, the way I developed the idea was I started with a beginning and an ending. So I developed the ending almost first. The idea was have a good beginning that grabs the audience and then have a shocking ending so that when they leave the theater, they are talking about your movie. So I came up with a beginning and an ending and then I filled in the middle. The ending wasn't influenced by anything in particular other than needing to come up with something with a big twist that was going to shock the audience and hopefully they don't see it coming end quote in films like sleepaway camp the transgender body is the joke the shock and the fetishized object for the non-queer audience now one thing with this argument that i definitely don't want to imply is that queer authors should only write queer horrors and non-queer authors should never try to tackle queerness i think a really great example of a non-queer author tackling a queer horror and and the transgender subject especially uh, centrally with a lot of respect and nuance is uh brad michael elmore's bit um, it's not a slasher, it's a queer vampire uh, horror. And so, you know, examples like Elmore's Bit shows that non-queer authors can tackle these representations. And they are particularly successful when they research and write from the lived experience of queer collaborators, establishing not only authentic queer representation, but the radical possibilities of a queer gaze that does not have to be oppositional in its looking. Um, now, I don't have the time to go uh, deep in detail as to what happened in the 80s and 90s, but I mean, very generally, we know that slashers were huge in the 80s. The queer codes in them became uh, a lot more uh, subvert and, uh, and, and detrimental. It would ruin careers. Um, oftentimes, especially in the 90s, there was a lot of straight washing and original drafts of, of the slashers that came of that time. But really where I want to move forward to is towards the rise of digital filmmaking in the 21st century. And, when, and um, this whole move has opened up the cinema sphere to anyone crafty enough with an iPhone, a group of friends, and blood purchased from Party City to make a film. Queerness and horror is as en vogue as ever, yet where does the queer author stand? How does the queer gaze operate in a time of unprecedented mainstream coverage of queerness, but also unprecedented attacks on queer bodies and reality, particularly of transgender people in legislature and transgender women in murder statistics? The question is rather what insight can be gleaned from studying queer authorship in the 21st century about the current state of queer horror and there is no better place to start than with 2017's knife plus heart um so Jan Gonzalez released the period slasher piece, uh, Knife Plus Heart, uh, set during a uh, summer in 1979 Paris. This film revolves around a lesbian producer slash director of male-on-male -male pornography, Anne, as she grapples with the deterioration of her long-term relationship and brutal murders of the actors she employs. The film is graphic to the extreme. In one scene, a leather black dildo with a retractable switchblade is inserted anally into a victim, and in another, a same-sex sexual assault occurs between Anne and her ex, Lois. Queer bodies are mutilated on screen without hesitation, yet the film never verges on exploitative. The killer in the film is eventually revealed to be homosexual himself, a young man once caught in a secret affair with his best friend by his father, then castrated by his father, and then witness to the murder by arson of his lover in the family's barn. When talking about the inspiration for Knife Plus Heart, Gonzalez says, quote, for this specific one, everything started with the main character. I was inspired by a real female producer of the 70s. She was an alcoholic, super violent, and humiliated her actors. But at one point, I thought it was a bit too sordid, so I turned this character into someone more glamorous, more romantic, a woman in love. But I kept the idea of a relationship because in real life, she had a relationship with her editor, and I loved this idea of love transmitted by the images, by cinema, and contaminating the images themselves, end quote. Rather than queerness being the subversive other in the film, love and its refracting sickness is what condemns nearly all the characters, leading into a dreamy, heaven-laden 
visual epilogue of the queerest utopia. Due to the extreme violence done to queer bodies in Knife Plus Heart, the queer gaze should be oppositional. Yet, what happens instead is a reversal, a morbid tenderness at the multiplicity of villainy, the confines of love in various forms and edible complexes. Stephen Shaviro's concept of embodied spectatorship argues that what a spectator witnesses on screen is mimicked physically and emotionally during the viewing of a film. For years, queer spectators witnessed the mutilation of, que of queer appropriated bodies on screen, affirming harmful biases of their own or triggered by trauma inflicted in these films. Embodied spectatorship has some value in this history, but queer authored horrors like Knife Plus Heart propose a subversion of the effects of the phenomenon. In the film, people do not die because they are gay, nor is queerness the condemnation of their being. The queer author can metaphorize experiences non-queer authors have only stabbed at in attempts to fetishize the notion of queerness. Gonzalez, an openly gay man, understands his characters as humans with flaws first, not by the shock value of their identification, despite disturbing imagery. The queer spectator thus does not embody their response to their to the film as a punishment for queerness, but rather as a response to the other nuances present in the characters. As best said by Gonzalez, quote, when I make a film, I always have the impression that there is a duel between me, a film buff, and me, the filmmaker, or between the cinephile and the filmmaker. I think that the images usually re reflect my cinephile or cinematic unconscious at work, while the dialogue and the action and the plot comes from my more sensitive experience as a human being, not only as a cinephile. It is as if I'm trying to build a war that grows inspiration from all the films that I've seen in my life, which then allows the characters to resemble me and my own personal experiences of friendship, of love, and also of my fears, end quote. This is what is lost when queer authors are not given the chance to share their own interpretations of queer horror. Now, I know I'm running up against time, but really quick, I want to uh, mention Christopher Landon as an example of uh, a queer sensibility at work. Most of his films, uh, don't really have queerness explicit in their text, particularly here in this example for Freaky. Um, and so, but there's this really brilliant moment in, in Freaky that I think is quite emblematic of uh, of a queer sensibility working in a, in a filmic text that doesn't have queerness explicit um, within it. And so I just wanna go over it really quick. Um, the queerest moment in Freaky does not even include the only other the only queer character in the film. Rather, when Millie, caught in the Blissfield butcher's body, professes her feelings for her long-term high school crush, Booker, he reciprocates the feelings on the spot despite the body switch. Booker expresses the wish to kiss Millie as the butcher, already radical in its dissolution of heteronormativity despite the heterosexual context. Millie reminds Booker that at the moment she is a man, and without hesitation, Booker initiates the kiss, brushing Vaughn's nose affectionately, assuring her that you're still Millie to me. The camera does not pull away from the same-sex kiss, something that easily would be played for laughs in another Vince Vaughn film from just a decade ago. Here the kiss is more of a wink, the queer cheekiness that normalizes the act and attacks heteronormativity at its base quote, free from tokenism and broad generalizations to which the genre can often resort, end quote. And, um, and yeah, I'll go ahead and, and end it there. All right. Okay, thank you, Mai. And uh, our last speaker is Peter Marra, who holds a PhD in English with a focus in film and media studies from Wayne State University. His forthcoming book, Queer Slashers, argues the queer lineage and function of the slasher and explores variations on the subgenre by queer filmmakers. Additional works, additional works, sorry, appears in Film Criticism, a Bright Light Film Journal, and the edited collection Recovering 1940s Horror Cinema, edited by Lexington Books in 2015, refocus the films of William Castle, William Castle, edited by Edinburgh United, um, University Press in 2018, and Final Girls, Feminism and Popular Culture, edited by Palgrave Macmillan in 2020. And the title is The Sun Will Come Out Tomorrow, or Will It? Reimagining the Slasher in Serial Mom. So thank you, Peter. You can start now. Thank you very much, um, Anna. Thank you as well as everyone else has shared to both Daniel and Wickham for organizing this. And a thank you to you all for being here. I greatly appreciate it as I have presented to you literally empty rooms in my lifetime. Um, let me just share the screen and please do let me know if the things I think I'm sharing are not there. 
All right. Um, so uh, to begin, um, I'll ask that you bear with me a bit, uh, not only because of my technical difficulties, uh, but also because this material is taken from a larger book project that I'm currently working on. And so I've done my best to keep the presentation contained within itself, um, but you will hear me gesture a bit to other ideas that I have, which either proceed or follow this in book form. Um, in keeping with that concern, I'd like to begin by helping to situate Serial Mom within my larger project on queer slashers. So it is sometimes pertinent and new information to people that slashers contain a history of queer characters, but I suspect it won't be especially new uh, to most people in this context. Uh, but generally speaking, um, the project begins by reflecting on the queer lineage of the slasher. This traces back all the way through to something as early as 1927's The Lodger. Um, I focus on the prominence of queer or queer coded characters as killers in these films everything from feminine or infantilized men in the 1940s to cross-dressing killers like Norman Bates and his many imitators to trans or potentially trans killers like Angela in Sleepaway Camp. Um, I'm also especially intrigued, as you might notice here, with how many queer performers have been cast to play such characters uh, and how much this screen presence of queerness seems quintessential to the slasher. Um, I also pose that there is an important value in setting the slasher uh, with its queer characterizations and queer themes in context with the queer cinema to which it was up here. Uh, for example, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is released in 1974 with its cross-dressing killer Leatherface. Uh, and also in 1974, John Waters' Female Trouble is released with its cross-dressing killer Divine. Uh, I argue that much of what is countercultural and counter to normativity in, its, in queer cinema of the 70s helps us to understand better the queer resonances of mainstream horror, which bears some striking overlap. Um, I'm also keen on setting the slasher in a timeline of queer history, uh, so to lean on Leatherface just a bit more here, um, I'm compelled by, for example, how Leatherface in 1974 uh, recalls visually the image of Dr. John E. Fryer um, a gay psychiatrist who in 1972 appeared before the American Psychiatric Association as Dr. Henry Anonymous uh, to give a speech attesting to the need to remove homosexuality from the DSM as a mental illness, uh, which was accomplished the following year in 1973. Uh, Fryer, of course, did so masked and under a pseudonym to avoid harm to his reputation and his practice. Um, there's a kind of surface visual similarity there, but needless to say more deeply, the slasher seems to me to follow strongly on the heels of the late 60s and 70s gay liberation movement following the 1969 Stonewall riots. Unlike previous national gay rights movements, which saw assimilation as a primary goal, gay liberation named the structural forces of their oppression and demanded a new society. Uh, this included psychiatry, the law, religion, media, and capitalism, to name just a few things. Um, I argue that the slasher has queer resonance because it represents such a clear affront to the structures of oppression targeted by gay liberation, as seen in the figure of a social outsider with queer lineage, systematically dismantling through the visual metaphor of violence, heteronormative white suburban communities, and particularly rituals of heteronormative adolescence, uh, such as prom night, uh, graduation day, and summer camp. So what then is serial mom? the topic of today's talk. Uh, Serial Mom, for me, begins an important section of the book that turns from exploring the queer resonance of the canonical slasher cycle to specifically identifying queer filmmakers' engagements with their tropes and subsequent variations of the subgenre. Uh, in Serial Mom, instead of an outsider intruding upon a picturesque middle-class white suburban enclave, uh, we see a central killer who comes from within mother, wife, and all-around peachy keen neighbor Beverly Sutphin, uh, played by Kathleen Turner as an exaggerated TV sitcom version of a suburban housewife. Uh, more importantly, the violence exhibited by Beverly does not work against the normative values of the community, but rather comes as an extension of them. Beverly chooses as her targets those who she feels have made infractions upon the serene, picture-perfect suburban dream she wishes to secure for herself and her family. Uh, she goes after people who do not recycle or who wear white after Labor Day. Uh, really crucially here, we see queer filmmaker John Waters taking the language of the slasher and using it to a new, very queer end by inverting the subgenre's tradition of framing queer, trans, and or gender nonconforming figures as murderous threats to heteronormative bliss. 
Uh, instead, it focuses upon the kinds of selfish violence the exclusionary hypernormative communities common to the slasher perpetuate. Uh, Justice Gay Liberation took to naming the oppressive structures of normativity that continue to harm and disenfranchise queer communities. Waters here visualizes through horrific violence the natural end to a heteronormative and hyperconformist conservative ethics. Uh, we see Serial Mom framed as a response to the slasher through the invocation of several of its popular motifs, including its references to vulgar and sexual phone calls. Uh, in the film, we see Beverly calling Dottie Hinkle, played by frequent Waters player Mink Stoll, uh, and using a modified voice to call her cocksucker and fuckface, among other obscenities, uh, even going as far as calling and posing as a phone company investigator to lure Dottie into repeating the perversities back to her. Um, the scene recalls a history in the slasher of women receiving harassing, heavy breathing, and sometimes sexual calls from their killers, uh, perhaps best personified by the gif in the middle there of Freddy Krueger's tongue coming through the phone to harass Nancy in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, interestingly though, Waters' film distinctly positions honest perverts, humor, uh, horror fiends, gore hounds, freaks, and punks as harmless background players living at the fringes of the neighborhood. Uh, Beverly's son Chip, played by Matthew Lillard, is critiqued throughout the film by characters alleging his interest in horror films is sick. Uh, Beverly is called into a meeting with Chip's teacher, Mr. Stubbins, who affirms Chip is doing excellently in school, but insists there is that his interest in horror films demands therapy. Uh, he even goes as far as to ask whether Chip tortures animals, suggesting the early stages of Chip being a serial killer. Uh, the film consistently plays off the irony of quote-unquote upstanding suburban authority figures showing suspicion toward those with fringe interests while being totally unsuspecting of actual serial killer Beverly who goes undetected because she conforms to expectations of normativity. Uh, we see Chip watching films like Blood Feast and Straight Jacket uh, with his friends who laugh and cheer along harmlessly. Um, Chip's friend and co-worker co Birdie, played by Patricia Donick, uh, as seen here, at first grins delighted that she learns when she learns that Beverly is a serial killer. Um, uh, conflating it with her horror movies that she loves, she tells Beverly, you're bigger than Freddy or Jason, only you're a real person. Uh, but when Birdie witnesses the body of one of Beverly's real victims, she bursts into anguished tears, realizing that her love of horror movies is nothing like violence in real life. The scene draws a sharp distinction between Beverly's actual violence and the fun of representational gore. Uh, likewise, another scene of murder shows us the unsuspecting gentleman, this unsuspecting gentleman cruising for gay sex at a glory hole in a men's public bathroom, uh, only to stumble upon an unexpected Beverly brandishing a weapon. Uh, the man flees for safety. Uh, however, following her own real life moment of murderous score, uh, Beverly walks away free. Nonetheless, the police question the bathroom cruiser aggressively, alleging that he is lying to them about there being a woman in the bathroom. This history of villainizing or presuming ill intent of queer communities has a long history, but I'd like to consider Serial Mom and Beverly in particular in light of anti-gay activist Anita Bryant. Um, Bryant was a well-known singer and spokesperson for Florida Citrus, uh, when in 1977 she spoke out against legislation in Dade County, Florida that would end employment discrimination for gay teachers. Uh, Bryant's campaign against the legislation lasted several years and served as the impetus for the creation of the Save Our Children campaign. Uh, Bryant's celebrity and her traditionally wholesome public image that readily invoked her religion as a Christian woman to defend her bigotry drew a tremendous amount of public attention and made her the national face of anti-gay politics, leading to things like a national boycott of orange juice due to Bryant's prominent role as a spokesperson, which resulted in gay bars refusing to sell screwdrivers and in protests. Uh, during a 1977 press conference, Bryant was famously pied as a form of protest from gay rights activists opposing her anti-gay rhetoric. Um, among her most vile comments were her insinuations of pedophilia and harm to children caused by gay teachers. Uh, she was often quoted arguing that, quote, homosexuals cannot reproduce, so they must recruit, end quote. Uh, one ad for Save Our Children played like this. The Orange Bowl Parade, Miami's gift to the nation, wholesome entertainment. But in San Francisco, when they take to the streets, it's a parade of homosexuals, men hugging other men, cavorting with little boys. The ad's creator... Um, 
the relative success of Save Our Children in garnering national attention and fomenting anti-gay sentiment has been seen as a precedent to Jerry Falwell's moral majority, which used religion as a premise to propel anti-gay rhetoric into national politics and public discourse by stoking fears and playing off damaging stereotypes. This became especially egregious amid the HIV AIDS, the HIV AIDS crisis of the 1980s, uh, during which Falwell publicly attested that, quote, AIDS was God's punishment for homosexuals, end quote. The deliberate and malicious harm created by such rhetoric no, du no doubt factored into the immense inaction of the period to address the epidemic and progress a virulent stigma that gay Americans deserved illness and death. Lee, Lee Edelman references moving such a save our children when, when he puts forth, uh, sorry, Lee Edelman references move in such a save our children, which put forth the seemingly irrefutable imperative to protect children as a means to discriminate against queer people when articulating his antisocial polemic, No Future. Uh, he states that the child serves as, quote, the emblem of futurity's unquestioned value, unquote. Whereas the queer, quote, comes to figure the bar to every realization of futurity, the resistance to every social structure and form, end quote. Edelman advocates for the refusal of oppositional identity politics and meaning, and for the acceptance of the burden on queerness to figure the cultural death drive. Edelman contends that the queer and the child serve as oppositional markers in a cultural logic designed to sustain futurity by displacing the death drive onto the shoulders of the queer who stands for the failure of reproduction and violence against the future or the child. Uh, among the cultural texts in which he locates this construction are figures of musical theater, Annie from the musical Annie and what he calls the quote unquote revolutionary waif uh, on the post of Les Mis, uh, both of which figure as bright beaming bastions of hope for a future, uh, and both shows of which turn on a crucial song about the future, Tomorrow from Annie and One Day More from Les Mis. Uh, he comes to phrase his antisocial position through an indictment of the system affirmed by such figures, stating, quote, Fuck the social order and the child in whose name we're collectively terrorized. Fuck Annie. Fuck the waif from Les Mis. Fuck the whole network of symbolic relations and the future that serves as its prom. End quote. It's tempting to see the slasher as a collection of films in which an outsider, sorry, it's tempting to see the slasher, a collection of films in which an outsider commonly marked by sexual difference murders wholesome archetypes of American teenagers as a construction akin to Edelman's own observation of the queer as bearer of the death drive and the child as the promise of a future. However, I think there are more complex ways to respond to this observation. Uh, one such incredibly meaningful way is in queer artist David Warnerovich's untitled piece from 1990, just two years prior to his death from complications of AIDS and four years before the release of Serial Mom. Uh, here he juxtaposes an image of himself as a child, a visual not unlike the figures Edelman criticizes of Annie or Les Mis, but accompanying the photo is text explaining the cruel and vile ways this particular child will face physical harm and discrimination because he is queer. It calls to mind the failings of claims to, quote, save our children and the manner in which such ideologies hypocritically perpetuate harm to some children based on discriminatory systems of value. Warnerovich's text contains the following, quote, one day this kid will talk. When he begins to talk, men who develop a fear of this kid will attempt to silence him with strangling, fists, prison, suffocation, rape, intimidation, drugging, ropes, guns, laws, menace, roving gangs, bottles, knives, religion, decapitation, and immolation by fire. Doctors will pronounce this kid curable as if his brain were a virus. This kid will lose his constitutional rights against the government's invasion of privacy. This kid will be faced with electroshock drugs and conditioning therapies in laboratories tended by psychologists and research scientists. He will be subject to loss of home, civil rights, jobs, and all conceivable freedoms. All this will begin to happen in one or two years when he discovers he desires to place his naked body on the naked body of another boy." End quote. Another complex response to the system Edelman describes can be found in an especially potent scene of Serial Mom in which Beverly follows Mrs. Jensen home from the video store after learning she does not rewind her VHS rentals, an unforgivable action. Uh, as a response to this minor infraction of etiquette, Beverly delivers to Mrs. Jensen a fatal blow of violence with her own homemade leg of lamb while she sits in the throes of her latest movie of choice, Annie. Uh, 
uh, singing along to, to The Sun Will Come Out Tomorrow. Um, I argue that the scene's appeal is twofold, that in the midst of Beverly's attack, which comically juxtaposes the bland happiness and incessant futurity Edelman describes in Annie with visceral blood spattered violence, the scene delivers a satisfying sentiment of resistance to this normative energy of perpetual futurity. It gives us that fuck Annie moment Edelman uses so effectively to entice his readers. Uh, because from the perspective of queer communities who have suffered at the expense of save our children and endless invocations of the child as a reason for our harm and discrimination, uh, fuck Annie can feel like a very valid and necessary response. However, I feel the scene does more than just that, and calling on the Wonderovich, I point to how the scene importantly shifts the accountability of the violence to the systems of power which participate in our oppression. Slashers are complicated for queer spectators because we often recognize the homophobic or transphobic characterizations of the queer coded killer, but also feel a spirit of resistance to normativity in watching them tear apart the prom and other normative rituals. Uh, there is duality between that resistant energy to normativity, the fuck Annie of it all, but also a logical re recognition that these films were made by predominantly straight artists for straight eyes, and we are maybe not their heroes. Uh, but in Serial Mom, we get all the indulgent potency of Fuck Annie, of that resistant push, but we also see the responsibility for violence squarely replaced from the shoulders of queers, who Edelman describes as figuring the death drive in the social order, to the shoulders of heteronormative white middle-class America, the people like Anita Bryant, who have advocated against our rights, who call us pedophiles and tell us we deserve disease and death. In Serial Mom, we see a true naming of the power which does us harm, and so with respect to Edelman, I say that here we have a representation that resists normativity and heteronormative futurity, but also performs the political function of naming the violence against us, rather than only accepting a role antithetical to society and meaning. Thank you.